Hi there, I'm Rivka. Rivka, the daughter of Miriam. My name, though, is really not of much relevance. You don't need to remember it. All you might want to remember about me is that I lived in Jerusalem, where my husband and I had a stall in the market, and that it was in our home that our Lord Jesus ate his last meal. Before I tell you my story, though, won't you join me in prayer? Lord, you have set before us a table and prepared a feast for us, a meal of bread and wine, of meat and bitter herbs. You call us to the supper of remembrance. You call us to serve and to be served. As we break the bread and share the cup, our understanding may fail us. But we will never forget your example. We will never forget the full extent of your love. Amen. I wasn't even one of his close followers. As it so happened, my second cousins, once removed, are Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. They had hoped that Jesus would spend the Passover festival in their home in Bethany. But Jesus did not want to put them in any more danger. After all, the high priests, spies, were already keeping track of everyone visiting their home. Plus, Lazarus was still a bit weak after spending four days in a tomb before Jesus brought him back from death. That's how my family ended the story. Nobody suspected us of being followers of Jesus. Plus, we are blessed with a spacious upper room that could fit many people which is why Martha suggested that Jesus' disciples ask me. By the way, while I tell you about the events of that night, I suggest that you follow along in your own home or car and do as I do. Before our guests arrived, my children and I set the table with a plate and a cup for every guest. To create a festive atmosphere, we added candles and flowers. We made sure that each guest had their own bench. But I don't expect you to recline on benches for your meal. Customs have changed over the centuries, I am sure. We also placed a water basin and towels nearby so that our guests could wash their hands before sitting down for the meal and say their prayers.
Once Jesus and his friends arrived, they sat down and said the blessing for the food. While they were eating, one of Jesus' followers retold the ancient story of how God liberated our people from slavery in Egypt. On Passover, the Jewish people celebrate how God liberated our ancestors from slavery. Our forebears arrived in Egypt during a period of famine. At first, they were honored and respected because one of their own, Joseph, was second in command to the king. But then a new king arose who did not know this history. That king was afraid that our people would become more powerful than the Egyptians. So he enslaved them, and for generations the Hebrews ended up building cities for the Egyptians. Over the years the plight of the children of Israel worsened, and their cry rose to God. God now had a plan to save them and lead them back into the land of Canaan. God's plan involved a man named Moses. As a baby, Moses had survived the king's murder of all newborn Hebrew baby boys. Ironically, Moses ended up being raised by the king's daughter in the king's own palace. But then he was forced to flee to the land of Midian after he killed an Egyptian slave master. In Midian, he got married, had children, and worked for his father-in-law, Jethro. While he was herding Jethro's sheep one day, Moses heard God speak to him from within a burning bush, and God revealed to Moses his own name and told him what to do. Moses returned to Egypt and went to see Pharaoh many times to ask him to let the Israelites go. But Pharaoh refused to let our people go. To change Pharaoh's mind, God brought nine terrible plagues to the Egyptian. First the Nile waters turned to blood, then swarms of frogs overran the land, lice infested all humans and animals, hordes of Wild animals invaded the city. A pestilence killed all domestic animals. Painful boils afflicted the Egyptians. Hail rained down from heaven. Swarms of locusts devoured all the crops. And then the sun stopped shining and darkness covered the land. But the king still did not relent. Finally, God plotted another plague the most terrible plague of all, the death of all firstborn in Egypt. This is what happened. God told Moses that the Israelites should paint lamb's blood on their doorposts. This way God's angel would know that Jewish people live here. The angel would pass over that house and not kill their firstborns. This is where the name Passover comes from. The day came and events unfolded as God predicted. On the 15th day of the month of Nisan, all Egyptian firstborns are killed at the stroke of midnight, even Pharaoh's own son. Finally, the king has had enough. He summoned Moses and ordered him to take the Israelites out of Egypt immediately. Go, just go, leave. Finally, after 200 years of slavery, our people are free again. Eventually, we served the main course, lamb, in celebration of the first Passover. 
The lamb was served with all the trimmings, with unleavened bread, an egg, bitter herbs, salt, and sweets. The conversation around Jesus' table was lively. His friends were teasing each other. They also excitedly recalled the events of the last week. The hosannas, the palm branches and cloaks, the stunned look on the faces of the money changers at the temple when Jesus sent their coins flying and overturned their tables. Lazarus featured in their conversation too and the amazing way in which Jesus brought him back from death. There also was the usual talk about the Romans and how to get rid of them, about the latest skirmishes between the governor's army and the zealot guerrillas. Off and on, conversation would turn somber when one of them remembered Jesus' predictions that he would soon die. Then everyone began to sing. Some time passed, and then, all of a sudden, Jesus got up, took the hand wash basin and towel, and began to wash his disciples' feet. I tell you, that guy Jesus was strange. I didn't see that coming. Even though he was their rabbi, their leader, he stooped down and touched their dirty feet. Mind you, those feet were dirty. One of his friends, I believe it was Peter, was a bit eager and begged Jesus to wash not only his feet but his hands and head as well. But Jesus just ignored him and instead taught them all about love and about serving other people. Some more singing followed.
for hours. They were chatting, and singing, all of them, except one, Judas, who seemed more somber and quiet than the rest. Out of nowhere, it seemed, Jesus dropped this little bomb. Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Immediately, all of them agreed that this can't be. Others might turn on Jesus, but not one of them, not one of the twelve. For three whole years, they had followed Jesus wherever he went. They all had left their families and former lives behind. Why should one of them now betray Jesus to the authorities? That was utterly unthinkable. Each one of them told Jesus, Surely, you don't mean me, Lord. But then Jesus added, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then it was Judas's turn to ask, Surely, you don't mean me, Rabbi. This time, though, Jesus quietly and almost unnoticeably responded, You have said so. Judas was not the only one who was singled out by Jesus that night. Jesus also predicted that one of them would disown him in public. As he had done so many times before, Peter said out loud what the rest of them were only thinking. Even if everyone else will abandon you, I never will. Don't be so sure, Jesus said. This very night, before the rooster crows at dawn, you will deny me three times. Somewhat predictably, Peter protested. Even if I had to die with you, Lord, I would never deny you. And all the others said the same thing. The strangest thing, though, was that Jesus simply said these things matter-of-factly, but without blaming either Judas or Peter. If I had been in his place, dishes would have been sent flying through the air. I would have shouted and screamed and blamed and punched. But not so Jesus. Will you please pray with me? This is love, that you spoke words of comfort, walked with the unclean and unloved, brought healing into lives, walked a painful road to the cross, shared living water, bread of life, challenged the status quo, and brought salvation to the world. This is love. It is a seed sown in the ground, which ripens, blossoms, and spreads its sweet perfume. Amen.
just when I thought that the evening was about to bind down. Jesus asked me for some bread and for another cup of wine. After I handed him both, he did something that I will never forget as long as I shall live. He took bread and gave thanks, saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Afterwards, Jesus took the cup that I had given him, gave thanks and offered it to his friends, saying, Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the universe, who makes the fruit of the vine. Drink from this cup, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus said the word covenant, I shuddered inside and remembered the other covenants God had made with our ancestors. With Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, I also remembered how God made a covenant with our whole people when we were gathered at the foot of the holy mountain. And then I remembered the words of the prophet Jeremiah, that God would make a new covenant with his people, a covenant written not on cold stone tablets, but into our living hearts. Could it be that Jesus was the one making God's new covenant with us, God's people? Little did I understand that night about all these things. Only much later was I able to connect the dots. Now, today, I can see clearly how Jesus was not the one making the covenant, but that he was the lamb that was slaughtered to seal the covenant the Lamb that died for our sins, the Lamb that died so that we can live forever. Jesus was the one who cut a new covenant in his own flesh with his own blood to bridge the barrier between God and God's people. That night, Jesus offered his friends more than a simple meal. With the bread he broke and the cup he blessed, Jesus offered them a new covenant, a feast that fulfills God's promises of redemption, a feast that points to the wedding supper of the Lamb that we will one day celebrate in God's very presence. Alas, I'm getting ahead of myself. The night that all this happened, I did not know that he would die so soon. In fact, the next day, before they all ate their morsel of bread and drank from the cup, they prayed together. That night, the prayer was new to me. By now, I know it so well. Let's say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Everyone had fallen silent. Everyone seemed stunned. Body broken, blood poured out. This cannot be. There must be a way to turn all of this around. Jesus, do something, they all seemed to think. They all, though, took the bread he offered to them and sipped from the cup.
two of the twelve, John and James, the sons of Zebedee, all of a sudden remembered an incident that had happened a few weeks back. Their mother had approached Jesus together with her sons, and she had knelt before Jesus to ask him a favor. What is it you want? Jesus had asked. She said, Rabbi, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Friends, you don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Was this cup of wine the cup I am going to drink? The two brothers now wondered. Had Jesus talked about the cup they had just shared with him? Or had Jesus talked about another cup? All this talk about Jesus dying, was that the cup they were going to share with him? Not long after, they all went out to the Garden of Olives on the other side of the Kidron Valley. Our house was quiet again and messy. We agreed that the dirty dishes could wait till tomorrow and everyone settled down for the night. Everyone except me. Quietly, I lit a candle and went back upstairs. As so often before, I found that doing chores helped me clear my mind. So, one by one, I removed the plates, the cups, the flowers, the candles, and finally the table linens, until everything was bare.
Then I set my bedtime prayers, extinguished my candle, and went to bed. Lord, I lay down in my bed full of hope for tomorrow, because you alone, O Lord, sustain me. Although life is full of challenges, I choose to believe and trust in you. I surrender all of me to you tonight, and I choose to rest in the warmth of your embrace knowing that you are an ever-present help in time of need. Amen.